Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is How Salesforce Does Enterprise Architecture. Uh, I'm Allison Park, and uh, also a thank you to our sponsors. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have had a career of 20 some years. Um, I started out as a customer of Salesforce, working in a manufacturing um, company. I started out as a programmer, then worked my way into programming manager and then VP of the information technology area. Then uh, got this crazy burning yearn to venture out into consulting and uh, became a Salesforce partner as well as a consultant working with ERP programs. And now I am an employee. Um, I'm also a strong Salesforce community member. I'm from Chicago, Illinois in the States. Um, so very active in the Chicago community. I'm also uh, a RAD program manager for workforce development. So if you're not familiar with the RAD program, it is teaching women to uh, develop in Apex. And we've got actually two parts. So I'm going to put in a plug for that, uh, both for folks to check us out. Um, we are very much in need of developer coaches. And we welcome all genders for developer coaches. So if you would like to do that, it's a great way to learn Apex development better and as well as uh, you know, really support a wonderful nonprofit. And I would describe myself as both administrator, developer, and now enterprise architect. So I want to talk to you today about enterprise architecture, um, specifically the practice that we have. I'm part of pre-sales. So we work with customers before they make an investment um, or a new investment in Salesforce. And we approach it very much from business as well as the technical angle, and we look at the whole of the organization. And I really want to break it down into a methodology for you because I think it can be used with any size organization, nonprofit, um, commercial business, whatever you've got, wherever you're using Salesforce. I think taking this approach can help make sure that you're investing in the right things and thinking about um, the right concepts before you start actually you know, putting in Salesforce. So I'm going to start out with a little bit of a why we do this enterprise architecture approach and why we do it at Salesforce as part of the pre-sales process. Um, I'm going to share with you our enterprise architecture methodology and then show you, kind of dig into that methodology and show you how we apply it. So what is enterprise architecture? So um, really the why around it, we like to use the urban planning uh, analogy because I think this is something everybody can really acquaint themselves with. If you don't have any planning um, as you're putting together a town or a city, um, everything's kind of hodgepodge, really put together. Um, you don't have common services. There aren't any good standards or policies. You just got things all over the place. It makes it super hard to live there. And certainly the more it grows, the worse the problem gets. So taking that back to the way we run our organizations, we want to be thinking about not doing that and rather looking at the right side and thinking about good urban planning. So thinking about, hey, what are we going to be doing in the future? Um, let's make sure we do the planning and the analysis of how we're going to grow, what we want to be thinking about, create efficient governed processes. Um, and in a city, you know, plan out that construction, how things are going to fit together, what common streets and schools and utilities we're going to use. Um, what standards do we need to be thinking about? Because where is the risk that we need to be aware of? Um, and then lastly, really making that organized, structured, and scaled for growth and change, most importantly. So um, really, the why boils down to three main reasons. Uh, the first one being business transformation. Businesses are always transforming, and I think especially as we've kind of entered this uh, thinking about the digital transformation, it's even more uh, pointed about what is that experience, uh, certainly for the customer, but also for the employee, um, the folks who have to work in the organization and who are actually giving that human touch, what's that experience for them? How efficient are they being? And data is throughout the organization. Data is leveraged across all the different areas. So marketing needs to be sharing data with sales, that needs to be sharing data with service and service with marketing. It's really everyone is touching different things. If you're talking about a manufacturing environment, you're also thinking about shop floor and things like that. 
So every organization really needs to be thinking about this shared data and making sure we understand um, how that data is flowing between and where the points of truth are. And then lastly, most certainly, all organizations have something of a heterogeneous environment, meaning you have different systems that may not be purpose-built to talk with each other. And how do you bring this together? How do you design it so that they can operate as part of the entire organization? So let me delve into the what. Um, this slide is really the, the summary of my entire uh, presentation really breaking it down into seven steps. And that first step is business strategy. So we wanna ground ourselves in kind of the North Star of the organization. What are we trying to accomplish? What is our mission? What are our core values? And really understanding that from the highest level. Then taking the time to delve into a customer life cycle. And as I talk about the customer life cycle, um, I'm really thinking about current state. Not what do we want to do, what don't we like, those kinds of things. Um, we really want to map out the good, the bad, and the ugly of the current state so we see the truth uh, on the page um, to understand uh, across that life cycle what's happening, what's not happening, um, what are those opportunities and, um, and issues that we're having. Um, then a capability map and gap, and I'll get into a lot more detail on this, but really boiling it down into the business capabilities and what does that look like? And then jumping over onto the technical architecture side of the methodology, capturing the current state, here are all the systems, these are how the systems today interact, and then creating that future state vision, where do we want to be from a technical perspective? And then a strategic roadmap really to map between that current state and that future state vision because very uh, rarely from a strategic sense are you gonna get there in one hop, you're gonna do a few iterations and you'll always be moving toward the future. And then lastly, underscoring really the whole thing is that business value assessment to understand for the investments we make in technology, are they supporting the business and are they gonna give us that payback? So I'm gonna dig down deeper into each one of these. So I'm gonna start with business strategy and what that looks like. Um, when we do this, we want to be um, very business value led and lightweight. So what we do is we sit down usually with a C-suite and we ask them some really high level questions with very little leaders. In fact, when I go into these conversations, I very often say, forget that I'm with Salesforce. Talk to me like a fellow human being about your business and tell me about those key goals that you want to do, um, whether those object objectives, those initiatives, either planned or even unplanned things you see on the horizon. How are you gonna measure success? Um, what are those risks and obstacles? What are the things that are you know, not keeping you up at night? It's pretty uh, pat kind of question, but really what are you seeing that's gonna stand in the way of you achieving these goals? Um, and if you could do one thing what would it be to drive that impact? And you use these questions really as jumping, jumping off points. If you're familiar with the V2MOM process, this may ring fairly familiar. It's really trying to do this in a very short period of time. So I try to keep these interviews that we do with that C-suite, which is usually four or five people at most, um, to 20 to 30 minutes, 30 minutes at most. You're not gonna get an executive that wants to talk to you much longer than that. They wanna get in, get out, be bright, be brief, be gone kind of idea. So we just really wanna boil it down. We hopefully have them doing most of the talking and sharing their thoughts. This helps us to really set that North Star of what we're trying to do in enterprise architecture. And then that second one, um, this customer life cycle process. Um, what we do with that is ideally we're all in one room. Certainly for the past two years, we haven't had that option. So we've used actually virtual whiteboards to create this, um, but it still looks the same. It's actually kind of prettier when we do it virtually because we're using tools rather than you know, drawing on a whiteboard and putting those sticky notes in. In the days before that virtual, those virtual tours, uh, tools, I was the one that went around, took pictures of all the things so we could capture all those sticky notes or rolling up the big sheets of paper, total nightmare. Um, so you wanna break it down across the very top um, really that value chain for the customer. 
it starts with the discovery, which is really in the marketing area. They're going on a journey, evaluating, buying, onboard, implementing, and finally, ideally that customer is getting the support they need and you're renewing that effort, having them discover more products and continuing on that journey. Um, and then we break it down into what translates usually into the departments. Sometimes it's the function area of marketing, sales, service, uh, depending on the organization, what pieces of functionality come into it. And we ask the team assembled, and we do just choose a representative group from each of those. And ideally, they're all in the same room or on the same call at the same time, because it's really helpful to hear from their fellow coworkers who are consuming the information as it pulls through that life cycle to understand what are the bumps and curves that start to get baked into the current process that they may not be aware of. So um, when we're in a room together, then people are putting up those sticky notes on a board as we talked about, and then we walk through what are the customer activities that each area sees? Um, what are the internal activities? These are the things I do in my area or I know they do in whatever area it is. And then pains and opportunities. Pains and opportunities are really the, the same coin and two different sides to it, but very often people can more easily articulate, I have a problem with this, I don't know what the solution is, or an opportunity, hey, I really wish we had a report that did this or what have you. So we really give it um, the opportunity to say how they wanna kind of flavor that feedback and we walk through it together to really make sure we've got the nuances that people put in those sticky notes all the way through that process. Um, so we, because we're keeping this lightweight and high level, we don't spend days or months doing this. Honestly, the longest we wanna spend on it is four hours, a lot of time in one room. And when I've done it virtually, very often I do break it into like two hour increments just because people get tired and you can't keep their attention. So anything you can do to help you know, keep it fun, keep it involved um, is really gonna make a big difference. But the good thing about virtual is that you have this all in one place and you don't have to do the, the photographs of all the sticky notes. Um, if you do this in person, what we're doing now is we'll have someone be the scribe while there's another facilitator at work. So you can keep this um, going at a high clip of pace and not take up a lot of time for folks. And then the third part of the business architecture piece is capability map and gap. So I want to talk a little bit about capabilities. Um, so really we use capabilities to articulate um, what is this business thing? So like lead generation, that's a capability. And it's really about defining what the business does. Um, doesn't get into the hows, it's not a requirement. It's really trying to be business terms, not technical terms. And um, it's really mapping that um, to a line of business, but not they're not the same as the line of business. Um, even going back a slide, talking about that life cycle analysis, like I said, keeping it cross-functional, not telling people, oh, you're in marketing, you can only put you know, sticky notes into marketing. No, go ahead and put them in sales, put them in service, wherever you have some insight into the process, because we're gonna keep this as a group process. So um, the capabilities, really the magic that's in them is it keeps people out of the how or solutioning in the process. They're thinking about, I need the ability to do lead generation or uh, account management or whatever that is. Um, and I don't try to get um, that organization to articulate back to me in terms of capabilities. We actually at Salesforce have like a physical cards of capabilities. We've learned not to hand those out at the beginning because people get so entrapped and kind of like looking at those capabilities. So what we really want them to do is do that customer lifecycle journey and then us as the enterprise architects go in and describe those capabilities. But what we do ask them to do with us is to score each of those capabilities. So once we've done that customer map, then we're gonna sit down and um, create the customer capability map and have them score them. So for each capability, we're asking for the capability itself um, in people, process, data, and technology, um, how, um, how well do you do this today? And I actually give them um, 
only between one and three. I don't want them thinking about it and scoring it. It's just like, it's low, it's medium, it's high. So if you've got the people you need, that's probably high. It's not a perfect score. You know, people can score all threes and that's totally fine. Um, the process is well defined. Um, we've got the data we need. We've got the technology we need. Um, if we start to get into the twos or the ones, that's usually saying it's completely lacking and it's a gap. Um, and then the same thing with business impact, high, medium, and low. Um, tell me for this capability, um, if I was doing it as well as I could, what would be the impact on the business? So we're really what we're doing is creating a um, heat map out of these capabilities. And I'll show you that in just a moment. I wanted to share this with you. Um, Matthew already shared this in uh, his presentation as well, but he's right. This is absolute gold. So if you take nothing else away from this presentation, this URL, sfdc.co slash sfcc, you'll have access to all these foundational uh, capability cards as well as some uh, specific to industries. And the other thing about um, this URL is we are continuing to iterate and refine these capabilities um, so that they, they match up. Uh, and as we do that, this URL will keep working. You'll just surface um, new capability cards. So um, that may be coming, a forward-looking statement, uh, sometime in the future. And so this is what a capability map looks like as an example. Um, when we've gone through that whole mapping exercise, and we've laid out each of the capabilities, um, including foundational capabilities, which are more um, you know, throughout each of the uh, areas. So things like mobility and collaboration, security, integration, how well are we doing that? And what's the business impact of those things? And then delving into marketing, uh, lead generation, over into sales, contacts, territory management, and on into support with knowledge management, case management, and things like that. When we go through that rubric with them, we end up with a scoring that looks like this. And it literally creates a heat map around those capabilities, like customer journey map here, um, that are high, medium, low. So we're looking for those high business impact things, but are have large gaps. We know that's what we want to probably put in first in the roadmap and say, how do we accelerate getting to those first? Very often when we improve those high, large gap items, they have a very positive effect on surrounding capabilities. And then as we start to get into EA methodologies uh, in the technical side, much of this may feel pretty familiar to you, uh, especially if you're a more technical person or developer. Um, is really understanding uh, what does the current state look like. Um, this is laying it out in a logical map, really talking in each of these kind of um, areas as far as uh, marketing, sales, quote, contract, order provision, so on and so forth, and really connecting them up. Um, definitely using color, we're using um, some red boxes here saying, hey, here's some areas in this example that we probably want to phase out or readjust. And then when we move into uh, the future state, um, then that's what we're going to focus on. And then we get to future state vision, and we have adjusted those red boxes and ideally simplified things so that the flow happens better. We've improved um, the integration and, and really created what they can conceptually understand is what their new uh, you know, IT structure will be look, look like. This makes lots of sense if you're a technical person, um, but I like to use Gartner pace layering when I'm talking to folks who are more business driven and I still want to talk architecture because I can start to kind of layer the systems at the top being that engagement system, which is really where Salesforce um, plays the most strongly at and then core operational systems or even integration and reporting and things that are real specific to that particular industry. And at the bottom, this foundational layer, those are systems of record, like ERP and human resource management and things like that, where you need to have those, but they're not systems that need to be flexible. They are ones that are really keeping the records of the organization. So this pace layering is a, a really handy idea coming from Gartner uh, of how to break things down. What that can look like is something along the lines of this, 
where you really have your architecture broken down. You have your actors toward the top with that um, value stream across the top and then broken down. I'm really big at trying to get it so that it goes left to right all the way through so it just makes more sense. But still, it's, it's conceptual, so it's not absolutely perfect. It's getting that idea across. And very often, executives can relate to this a little bit better because it's a little bit um, more high level of, OK, what's the stuff I need to have here? And how does it connect up? I'm using the blue boxes as the sales force and how that all connects up. And I'm using the capabilities so that I can really illustrate in um, you know, what we're improving and uh, where those capabilities sit with what system. And then uh, the next step, obviously, we talked about the current state. We talked about the future state vision. Talk about a strategic roadmap. So how are we breaking things down so that they're moving from uh, you know, really phase one, those high value items, those high items with bigger gaps? Ideally, we're putting those in that first column. That's not always possible, I will say. Very often, there's some foundation that needs to be built. Um, in order to get there, and then moving it through. I try not to do more than three phases. I don't know that I've ever done more than three phases because it's just too much to take on. Also, this changes over time. So what the business sets as that you know, final phase, that future art of the possible kind of thing, will change over time. We're going to have new technologies and new ideas, so you're continually updating the strategic roadmap. What I like to emphasize to people is this is not carved in stone. This is something that you continue to work with. It's very high level, so you wouldn't hand this off to uh, a developer and say, you know, go make this happen. But it at least lays it out so that you can align as you start to make investments so you don't quickly make investments and say, why did we do that? And how did that line up with where we want to go? And um, believe it or not, some Sometimes that happens in the real world. So the last thing I want to talk about is business value assessment. And in enterprise architecture, in this type of methodology, very often we have specialists who are financially focused, um, who bring in that expertise. And we'll sit down um, with the right folks who are going to say, yes, here's where the value is, and this is how we can articulate it, meaning we want to get um, the actual you know, agreement from the organization as far as where they see the value and how to measure that. You don't want to come in necessarily as Salesforce and say, this is going to result in, you know, X number of dollars, um, but rather understand, hey, when we make these improvements, this is the kind of, you know, uplift we're going to see. What we can bring as Salesforce is that we've done a lot of studying of our customers and surveying them to understand when they invest in certain tools and they're going after certain capabilities, over time, usually in the course of a year or more, um, what kind of lift have they often experienced? And when we're doing this kind of financial analysis, very often we want to be as conservative as possible. So if we see, you know, upping lead generation, we see with customers usually creating a 33% lift, um, we may even say just 5% lift. Because that's going to really make people feel like, yes, I can achieve this. And for us, we know that's a really safe bet as long as they, they go along that path. So it really pulls together um, you know, this whole methodology as we do this. And our, can we can, again, leverage this um, for any kind of organization. And in some organizations, especially larger size organizations, they have an enterprise architecture practice who continually is doing this and understanding where things are at. And these are some of the tools that I hope that you'll employ in your own organization um, to, to pull that together. So um, I want to thank you. I went through that really fast, but I'm really hoping we can have some discussion because uh, I found that in other times that I've, I've presented. So any questions on how to apply it or um, any other ideas or thoughts? Yes. It, it's not on Trailhead. Um, this is um, our 
uh, Salesforce's enterprise architecture methodology. Um, we don't do this for every customer, but um, only because we just don't have enough of us to do it for every customer. Um, definitely, this is why I'm out here sharing this, um, so that you can, you can see this, and um, I'm hopeful that one day we'll have more, maybe even on um, some of the things that we put out there. But um, I think it's hard sometimes for folks when they see this methodology to really kind of delve in it and figure out how to uh, apply it to their own organization. What I have seen really work well is at this very front area before you even undertake um, this effort, which ideally takes a matter of weeks, not months, um, you set your scope. You don't try to do the whole organization or boil the ocean or anything like that. Um, setting the scope and saying either we want to focus on a particular area, meaning like we just want to focus on marketing and so we're going to think about the inputs and the outputs to marketing in this, but we're setting the scope to a particular area or a particular business unit. Like um, many organizations have multiple business units that flow in together. And if you select one and really uh, drill down into that particular organi um, organization, that business unit, then you can move a lot faster because you're not trying to do more than you can take on at one time. Yes? So ideally, you're not, so you're exactly right. So we've got the business uh, talking and usually IT in the technical architecture. Is that what you're thinking? Yep, so we want to bring those two groups together, <laughs> as frightening as that may sound. Um, that's also the reason why we want to, at the front end, when we do that scoping, is pick that team that we can pull together to, um, to do this whole process together. So the uh, technical team will learn a lot because they'll understand from business where are we trying to drive, what are the priorities, and the business team will understand this is how I want to articulate that back to the technical team and the things that they need to deal with, the, the technical pieces that they need to bring together. So cross-functionally includes IT as well as the business teams as well. Great question. Yes? That's a really good point. So I usually think in terms of like nine months to a year per phase. So it's a larger time box. Um, but if you set your scope really narrow, that might be a matter of months, but it's usually not weeks or days or anything crazy like that. You know, uh, that's a really good point. Um, what I would recommend is governance and a governance process so that you are making this as part of your government's review so that as you're making changes to the environment, you've got business representatives and IT representatives, you know, approving these changes as they go into production and that part of that uh, center of excellence or governance team, no matter what it looks like or how big or small it is, they're coming back to this and aligning because you're right. Hey, you know, this was really important, but that was really more about this particular area and we decided we're not doing it. So we need to update that and eliminate it from the roadmap. And uh, conversely, if we need to add something in, adding that in and adding it in in the right, in the right slot. And when I do these, I also, um, we're very collaborative with the customer. So it's not something you want to go off and do and then at the end go, surprise, this is what we're going to do. You want to make sure um, that you're co-creating this process all the way through. So that at the end, it's more of a, this is what we've got to, and the we is the entire team, not just the few people here and there um, that were on the team that did this. You really want to keep those doors open and, and allow everybody to kind of see in and have their vote where it makes sense. Yeah. 
So very often I will sit down with a customer. So if a customer says, I need to do this in three days and start to say, do you have any of these things already done? Because they may say, oh yeah, we, we did work in understanding our business strategy or this is the specific uh, outputs that we have. They may have mapped their customer life cycle. In fact, I had a customer that handed me the fully mapped processes and we just put the sticky notes over the existing process. So we could highlight the pains, we could highlight the opportunities, the internal and the external activities, and um, it made it go much, much faster. Um, so anywhere along the line, um, you just work together to figure out what's the value you want to get at. So if someone's saying, I want to end up with a strategic roadmap, for example, then I know that we need to do the work around the customer lifecycle and understand what the priorities are. Yeah, great question. Yeah, Matt. Yes, it gets considered in all phases. Many times it comes out in those business strategy interviews, thinking about risks and obstacles, um, so that we think about those right up front, and we never forget about them going through because they're always going to be there. New ones may come up, going back to the updating of the strategic roadmap, that may impact it, and it may actually reflect in that capability map as, um, like we have GDPR as a capability that's foundational, so other things like that should be in the foundational capability map. Yeah. Um, ideally, we have in the capability, the customer lifecycle and the capability map um, analysis area, um, we have IT in there. And sometimes we have conversations, even in the customer lifecycle of, we don't really have a good way to do leads. Wait, we bought you the software that does this lead generation and you've never used it. Oh, why is that? So then we start to have a really good conversation and kind of uncovering that. Because otherwise, if IT is not in that conversation, we get to the strategic roadmap, they're like, hey, we've got a tool that already does that. Where did you consider it? And it's a, little, it's a little late in the game to pull that in. So the more we can create the right team with the right balance of perspective, the easier it goes. Yes? Um, less going through this methodology and more um, as we start scoping this, if technical debt comes out as a serious consideration, um, very often, at least from a Salesforce perspective, we will actually sit down and talk about remediation of an org um, before moving, moving forward to say, do we want to pick this up and start over? Or no, you need to improve what you already have. And we even, we've done that with one customer that had an org that was like 12 years old, they had a consultant come in at the very beginning and do some crazy things um, and uh, kind of threw away like things like account and <laughs> opportunity and decided they had their own ideas about it. And they said, oh, we know our Salesforce is a mess. So we went in there and we looked through it with a partner that they were going to use and we assessed it. And what we did was we actually called it phase zero, meaning don't go buy anything new, do this stuff first. And then that way you're not building things on a bad foundation. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So as we're going through the customer life cycle, um, doing that evaluation, working toward that business value assessment, that often occurs and very often we will introduce capabilities that they may not be doing right now 
but we introduce it really with the, the purpose of having that conversation in this get map and gap piece so that when we start talking about, um, I had a customer that actually didn't have an inside sales department. So they had salespeople that were going out and doing a lot of the things that could be done just in front of a, a computer. And so we started talking about inside sales capabilities and introducing that and the value that might uh, introduce as far as lightening the load on the field sales folks so they're not spending as much time in the hotel at night trying to do those things and introducing an inside sales team that would, would do those things. And we did that right here because what came up was, oh, we've thought of that before, but we didn't want to do that and here's why and really kind of expose that a little bit more so we could talk about it when we got to business value. Did that answer your question? You mean the, the value of actually doing this? Um, so I think like like going through this process, they their eyes get opened during that process. So ideally, again, uh, going through this process, because it is collaborative, um, we are usually working with a champion from the Salesforce side with a champion who's giving us feedback through that process and can say, oh, our executive's eyes were open, we didn't know about this issue or what have you, and we really try to pull that all together to put it on their strategic roadmap. Does that answer your question? Okay, 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 sure. Any other questions? All right, great. I think I am I'm getting out with plenty of time because I know I'm in front of the break, so <laughs> thank you very much uh, for coming.